doing? Yeah. Well, it's great to be together, and uh, man, this is an awesome time of the day right here. Yes. Yeah. So when you think about it, uh, I'm grateful because I know that everyone has a choice. And you could be doing a million other things at this time. Yeah. But you've chosen to come and worship the Lord with us today. And for that, I want to say thank you. Give yourself a round of To USA. Wow. Uh, a lot of you guys uh, were, were very familiar. He and I had an opportunity to take a two weeks vacation. And so uh, we flew over to Rome. All right. And uh, took a boat. We stayed in Rome a couple days, seeing some of Rome. Then we took a boat, a uh, big cruise ship, out of Rome for nine days. Mm. And uh, basically went to eight, eight different ports, but we were in Greece and Italy. All right. So we went to Naples, we went to Athens, we went to Santorini. Wow. You know, Santorini <laughs> was a stop where we had an opportunity to go to a vodka distillery. Oh. Because I just want to know the history. Come on, they speak more. They speak more. The history. I want to know the history. Come there. on, Mac. So, you know, we, we took the tour, and at the end of the tour, they actually give you an opportunity to taste the oh, vodka. Right. And they went from like just like rubbing alcohol, <laughs> all the way to like fruity type stuff. So right. the first one was the rubbing alcohol, and so they have it in front of you, and they say, okay, pick it up, smell it. So when I smelled it, I was like, nope, look at that guy. Yeah. I mean, guys, it literally smelled like rubbing alcohol. Not that Russian. But man, we would pick Russian it up, and bop, three times. <laughs> I was like, no, I don't think you. Let's keep going on. So finally, the fourth one, was the one that was actually doable for Nina and I, because it was actually, it was, uh, you can mix it with coffee. Wow. And so that's what made it a little bit good. Actually, I bought my good friend Pablo back some of that. Oh. He's been enjoying his uh, coffee oh. with that flavor. Oh, but amen. Take my coat off. You guys know me. It's hot here. Right. Bring it up. But uh, it's great to be back. Uh, by the way, I'm not taking another vacation next week. I'll be out of town on business. Oh, okay. And so we'll just be up in Frisco, but I just want to throw that out there. I want you brothers and sisters to be like, that brother traveled a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. So that's a business trip. But it's great to be here. We're going to talk about today Joshua 10. Let's go. All right. And the title is simply The Prayer That Stops the Sun. Mm. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to give you kind of like a summary of the first part of Joshua 10, and then we're going to read it together. And so as I summarize a lot that we're going to talk about in the first part of the lesson, I want you guys to put a mental thought in your minds as we read it in the Bible. I want to say, aha, that's what Bob was talking about that point. And so we're going to go through it, we'll read it, and then I got a couple aha points that I want to leave with you. So just a couple things as I read through it that stuck with me that I'm going to leave with you. Hey man, you guys with me? Hey man, so Joshua, this guy Joshua, it was a remarkable man. He grew up to experience firsthand the nation Israel's deliverance from Egypt. He saw the many miracles of God and he truly trusted God with his every being. You guys remember the stories he spied on the land actually with Caleb. You guys remember that? And he came back with a message of faith that God would surely help them seize the promised land. Yeah. But unfortunately, the majority of the day won because they were gripped by fear. Joshua and a lot of more of the brothers and sisters there. And so they were going into the desert to wander in the desert for 40 years. Yet during that time, we see in the Bible that Joshua kept his faith in God. Mm -hmm. No complaining, no blaming God. And eventually, God chose him to succeed Moses and take the nation into Canaan. Mm. And so, before we go on from there, I want you guys to think about, man, if you're in an undesirable predicament mm. in your life, what is your default characteristic? Do you instantly go to blaming God? Mm -hmm. This brother was in the desert for 40 years. <laughs> yeah. In the desert. It was hot. It was dirty. I mean, 40 years, but man, he did not complain, he did not blame God. What a great God. Mm -hmm. See, Joshua had to lead his men to fight their way into the promised land. He never doubted God's promise to Israel. 
We're going to read in Joshua 10 that the five Amorite armies was planning to attack. But Joshua went in for a preemptive strike. Mm. Again, I'm setting it up. So it's a lot of facts I'm going to tell you and we're going to read it. It's all good, bro. Joshua led his entire army on an all-night march towards the enemy's camp under the cover of darkness, right? So they could, so they could launch that preemptive strike mm. we're talking about. It took about two to three days on a leisurely pace. But Joshua and his army completed this distance in one night. Mm. They were focused. The long night march took the enemy completely by surprise. <laughs> When the enemy lines broke, the Amorites started to flee into the valley. We're going to see in verse 11 where God got, gets into the battle in our story. And as the sun sets towards the horizon during their battle, so they, 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 they surprised them. You know, they're going at it. They're winning a war. The guys are fleeing. The enemies are fleeing. And then the sun starts to set because they were fighting for most of the day. Joshua knew when he seen the sun about to set on the horizon, he knew that he had to do something radical. Mm -hmm. See, once it got dark, the enemies would slip away, and potentially that was his chance to have complete victory. Mm -hmm. Perhaps he realized that if I don't destroy them completely, mm -hmm. then it will always be lingering problems. Mm -hmm. There will always be different pockets of resistance yeah. that we would have to fight. Anything less of a victory, he knew would not glorify God. So he uttered this outrageous prayer that we're going to read about in Joshua 10, 12. And if you think that prayer we're going to read it is ridiculous, think about this. God answered it wow. without delay. Let's go to the Bible. You guys Let's go, bro. Yeah. Amen. The prayer that stops the sun. Let me get it open here. Joshua 10 and verse 1. Now, Donnie is the king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it. Doing to Ai and its kings as he had done to Jericho and its king. Mm -hmm. And that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and had become their allies. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai, and all its men were good fighters. So Adoni Sadiq, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hohem, king of Hebron, Paran, king of Jermuth, Jasper, king of Lachis, and Debar, king of Eglon. Come up and help me attack Gibeon, he said, because it had made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jermuth, Lattice, and Eglon, joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. The Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal. Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. Verse 7. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road going to Beth Haran and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Machadah. As they fled before Israel on the road down to Beth Haran to Achadah, Azekah, excuse me, the Lord hurled large hailstones down at them. This is what the Lord got involved. You got to remember said that? The Lord held large hailstones down on them. And more of them died from the hail than that were killed by the swords of the Israelites. That's awesome. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, 
Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you moon over the valley of Ajwa. So the sun stood still. That awesome mm -hmm. And the moon stopped. I don't think you guys got that. Yeah. yeah. The sun stood yeah. still. Yeah. And the moon stopped. Yeah. Till the nation avenged itself on its memory, on its enemies. And it's written in the book of Jeshar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There's never been a day like it before or since. A day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Then Joshua returned to all Israel to camp at Gilgal. Wow. Is that an awesome story of what? Yeah. Man, sun stop and moon. Just stay in your place right there. Mm.
Let me ask you today, family. We serve an awesome God. Now, whatever you're going through in your life, is it too hard for God to provide you with a victory? Mm -hmm. And have you come out on the other side? Mm -hmm. No, it's not. But we got to start praying yes. for those big prayers to right. God. Amen? Yeah. Amen? You guys with me? Yeah. Yeah. See, we worship the same God. The only difference from Joshua and Peter and the rest of the brothers and sisters from back in the day was that, again, they had their audacity to pray these prayers mm -hmm. that really lived up to God's mighty power and his glory. See, they didn't limit God, sometimes like you and I do. Mm. They didn't limit God with the things that they asked. Now, I'm not standing up here saying that, man, we ask these Big audacious prayer, and God is going to answer each and every one of them. Yeah. Can't tell you that. That's why God is God and none of us are not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What I can say is, man, we can ask him. And who knows? Maybe he'll blow us away. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right. Joshua believed in a good God. Let me catch up. How's your prayer life going? <laughs> Are you so connected with God to your prayer life that you can pray that prayer that Joshua prayed? Hmm. Or you can just pray a prayer that's going to challenge your faith. Are you so connected with God through your prayer life that whatever you pray in your heart of hearts by faith, you believe that God, if it's good for you, will allow it to happen? See, that's what Joshua was. He knew God knew the situation. And he said, you know what? Let me pray this prayer about this son yeah. and this move. Mm -hmm. Because God knows what I need. Mm -hmm. Could it be that, that you and I do not see as much of God's greatness because we have not, we have not gotten away from the ticket prayers? Wow. Mm -hmm. We have not asked for more than what's just natural and normal. <laughs> yeah. God, let me thank you for this food. <laughs> God, this, this weather in Southern California is awesome. Thank you, God. God, heal me from this flu that I had this week or two weeks. God, if you can get me through this flu. God, if you can help me pass this exam or this test, God. Oh, God. Don't get me wrong, those are worthy prayers. Yeah. But I think we can go further than that. Of course. That. Yeah. We can pray more, bigger prayers mm -hmm. to God. Mm -hmm. See, you and I, we don't have to worry about ever putting God in an awkward or embarrassing mm -hmm. position. We're not going to back God into a corner with our prayers or our requests. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got you now, God. Ah, oh, you can't do that one too big for you. Wow. It's not going to happen. You won't ever challenge God to do something beyond his aptitude. You and I will never challenge God to do something beyond his power. Beyond his authority. Beyond what he's capable of doing. We will never do that. So we need to learn how to stretch our faith and ask God for the supernatural. Yes. Yeah. Ask him for what he's capable of doing. Yeah. I need your help, everyone in the crowd. You guys know when I give the lesson, I'm up here, I'm asking you to do stuff, and then I check on it. Yeah. So I need us to start praying for two things. So. Write this down. The first thing I want you to pray a big, audacious prayer as is concerning God's church here. Mm. Mm. Specifically, downtown Skyline, yes. even more so, Metro LA. In LA and then God's worldwide church. Right. But if you want to ask me which one you want, Bob, downtown Skyline. Mm -hmm. I want you to write down and start praying about something that's big that God is going to do for this church. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to blow all of our minds. Come on. And then the second thing is the second one I want you to start praying is much more on a personal level. You can decide that, whether it's about your family. Loved ones, you want to be saved. Your marriage, your kids, your career, whatever it is, I want you to fill that in. I'm going to ask you guys about this. Okay. 
Pablo is going to ask you guys about this. Oh, yeah. 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 So please take time to think it through. The first one is on the corporate level, as they say, the church level. Something that's big that you want to see happen to encourage God's church. And the second one, on a personal level, you want to see happen. Amen? Amen. 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 We do those two things, and we start to see some of the victory stories that happen. And we start to hear some of the victory stories that happen. Then you and I will know it's not about us. It's all about God. Yeah. Because God is the one that's providing the victory. Amen? Amen. Not only I want us to dare to pray the God size prayers, but number two, I want us to don't stand in hope, but I want us to learn how to walk in faith. Right. Don't stand in hope. I want you to walk in faith. If I was putting this together, maybe some of the brothers, maybe some of the sisters, but it used to be a song back in the day, something like uh, hopes and dreams, you got to go after ways and means, or something like that. Mm. But I don't want us to stand and just hope. Man, I hope God will bless this church and let us grow numerically and, man, give us a place to meet that's, man, meet all our needs. And, and I hope that, let's just not stand at home. Let's walk in faith. Yeah. There's a difference there. Amen? Amen. We can pray and stand in hope. In other words, we can do nothing but just wait and hope that God will show up and do something. Right. I'll be honest with you, it's been a lot of times in my years as a Christian. You guys know my history. I was baptized in Chicago in March of 1990. Mm. It's been a lot of times in my walk with the Lord that, man, I've done nothing but pray and stand in hope and did nothing else. Just wanted to wait and hope that God would show up and do something. In James 2, 26, the Bible talks about that as being passive faith or dead faith. Wow. Talks about faith without deeds is what? Dead. It's dead. Dead faith. It's useless. Mm. See, as Christians, we need to show our faith by what we do. Mm. We need to show our faith by who we are. Amen. You know, they didn't know I'm going to lift them up now, but I'm going to lift up my faith partners with this. Pop one in Nicole. Amen. If someone didn't know that they were true followers of the Lord, true believers, all they would have to do is look at their lives, at their schedules, how they serve tirelessly, how they get with people every day of the week or meeting or staff meeting. You know, we have staff down in Gardena. I work in Simi Valley, and I live in Tarzana. So a lot of times I'll get off early to go home and freshen up to make that trek from Tarzana to mm, Nardina. Yeah. So an hour and 30 minutes later, I'm getting off the freeway to go to staff. Mm. That's every day for these guys. Mm. They serve. They give. Mm. Why? They don't want to be listed. Oh, no, no, no. Because their faith in God, they know God is doing something big in this church. Mm. How about you and your service? Mm. How about you and your walk of faith? See, we need to walk in faith. We need to get out of our comfort zone, family. Yeah. We got to get out. I mean, I, you guys know me, man. We first talked about meeting here at 3 o'clock. You guys remember that first service across the street? <laughs> and I preached. Yes. And I got vulnerable and I said, man, I am not liking meeting in the afternoon at 3 o'clock. Right. That's just crazy. Yeah. <laughs> now, deep down the south, I still feel that way. <laughs> But I'm at church. Yeah. 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 I make that trek on Sundays in the afternoon. Yeah. I'm going to church. Right. Yeah. What is it for you? What comfort zone that you in that you really got to get past so you get to the point where you can pray those audacious prayers for the Lord? Amen? Amen. Man, getting back to our story, it's amazing to see the extent of the human effort involved in that battle we read. Right. See, Joshua's army made an overnight, we talked about, long march and launched straight into battle. They didn't march all night and say, hey, let's take about eight hours, 10 hours, then we're going to battle. They marched all night long. And then they went right into battle, and then that's not the end of it. So they, they're fighting all day, and then their leader Joshua asked the Lord, hey, we need more time. Stop the 
son and the moon. Can you imagine some of those soldiers? Like, Josh, what you doing, man? Yeah. We're tired. We're tired. Yes. We didn't watch all night. We didn't oh. fall all day. Yep. You're asking God to give us another 24 hours to do this. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. He, asked the Lord, he asked the Lord to stay the sun for another full day. Wow. That had to be tiring. See, I want you guys to know, even though God was with them, he had given them the promise of victory. He was personally involved in the battle with them, right. raining hailstones on the enemy. It did not free them from their personal commitment. Mm. They still had to fight. God was with them. He promised them the victory. He had helped them out. But they still had to fight and been willing to fight. Into victory yep. was achieved. Amen? Amen. Amen. You guys with me with that? Amen. They had to fight the war. They had to sweat it out night and day. Wow. They had to pay the price. See, success doesn't come easy, even when God's promise and presence. That's a good point. I remember when I was a young Christian and um, maybe less than a year old, <clears throat> I was going through a tough time, you know, struggling in Jesus, you know, hating people. <laughs> Dodging brothers and sisters in the fellas, ah, oh. said something to me, I was like, I don't want to see you. <laughs> and I got some D time, I got some partnerships and discipleship time with one of the brothers, and basically he told me, he said, bro, look, nowhere in the Bible that God said, once you should Jesus more, mm. that your life would be a bed of roses. Yeah. Yeah. That brother said, grow up. Ooh. Learn how to deal with situations right. oh. and move forward. I want to give us that same advice. Come on, bro. No way in the Bible can you show me. If you know where it is, pull me out there and say, hey, Bob, read this here. And I can guarantee you, no way in the Bible did God say, hey, you see Jesus, Lord, you come out those words of baptism, your life going to be the bomb diggity. How about that one, Eric? Right? Yeah. How about that? How about that one? <laughs> Success doesn't come easy, even when God's in the picture and we're living out his promises. But God still wants us to be fully committed. Amen. Come on. Victory wasn't a gift dropped from the sky right to the soldier's lap with this story we read. They had to fight for the promised victory. Think about that. They still had to fight for something that was promised to them by the Lord. That's great. Point. That would have freaked me out, man. But God has told us we're going to win anyway. Why don't we fight? <laughs> we got to fight for the promised victory. So they did. God has given many of us his promises. God says he will be with us. He will yep. fight the battle for us. But we need to do our part. We need to put in the hard work and be committed. Amen? Come on, bro. Yeah. You guys with me? Yeah. Yes. So what I want to leave with you is this. The lesson we learned from Joshua 10 is that we serve a God that can transform the most adverse situations we face in our lives. We serve a God that can transform anything that we're going into. If you're visiting with us today, I want to encourage you. The God that we serve, we're not yeah. talking about anybody preaching from the pulpit, we're not talking about a church name, but the God that we serve, right. it's able to transform anything in our lives mm -hmm. for his benefit. Yep. So I want to encourage you to be visiting with us today or if you're coming out today, today is the first or second time, man, pull someone aside. Yeah. Say, hey, show me what Bob was talking about. Mm -hmm. Show me some of these promises and victories that God has promised us in the Bible. Right. Be excited to do that. For the brothers and sisters in the church, man, I want you to really think about what areas are holding you back for really being all you can be for our Father in heaven. What is it? What's holding you back? Like the people of Israel, you may be facing a very difficult situation. Again, I can't promise that God will stop the sun for you. That'd be awesome if he did. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine the stories now coming here on that Sunday? Y'all oh, ain't not gonna believe this, man. Y'all come on Tuesday when the sun seems like it just stopped. Come on. <laughs> that was me in my prayer. <laughs>
thinking about, I was gonna run this by Pablo, but I'll just throw this out Go here. Do it, bro. I think we need to think about starting a 3SP group. Mm. A 3SP group. Wow. What is What's that? What's that 3SP? Y'all tell me. Tell them, tell them. I don't know. Sun stands still group. Yeah. Wow. The Sun Stands Still Prayer Group. Mm. PSP group. Wow. And all we do in that room when we get together is pray these big prayers. <laughs> that the brothers and sisters in there just look at you like, well, <laughs> I think that'd be good for all of our faith. Amen. 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 See, because God we serve can transform whatever we're facing in our lives. You know, in conclusion, guys, one of the major Irritations that I have is when someone scores a plot of the movie. <laughs> yeah. A movie I was planning to see. Because when they tell me that, you know, oh, he dies at the end. Mm. Oh, oh, yeah, the boy gets the girl. Or they get married. Or they ruin. They win the champions. It's like, dude, you ruined the whole experience. <laughs> see, I, if I wanted to just know the outcome, I would, like, read the plot or just go to Wikipedia and say, hey, what happens at the end of the movie? Mm. That's not the goal when you see a movie, if you're like me. You want to feel the tension and the suspense. Yep. Yep. You want to be in that movie as you sit there in that big screen. Yeah. You want to wonder whether the good guy will win or the relationship will work its way out. See, the plot is the point. That's what keeps us in movies. We're interested in the plot. Then what's the underlying meaning there? What's really going on? I want you guys to think about what if the same dynamic that makes the plot the point of movies applies to our relationship with God? Mm. Is it possible that the process isn't just a waste of time for us or a commercial break in our lives? <laughs> Have you ever considered that in the overall scheme of God's design for our lives, the process just might be the point? What you're going through just might be what God is trying to get you to learn. Yeah. yeah. The process is the point. You should embrace the process, brothers and sisters. Yes. Because every big dream has a small beginning. Mm -hmm. Between the promise and the payout is what? The process. And the process is the point. The process is the point. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage you guys to dare to make God-sized prayers. To cling to his word. Don't just stand in hope, but walk in faith. Do what is necessary to bring honor and glory, much honor and glory, to our Father in heaven. Amen? Amen. I want us to learn how to pray prayers that stops the sun and tells the moon to stop as well. Mm -hmm. Amen, guys? Amen. 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 To God be the glory. Come Thank on, you, guys. Bob. Thank you.
because I know that that's the key to the success of my dreams. And hopefully, you could take that with you today. Amen? Amen. We do have a bunch of announcements. What's going on, church? Hey. 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 Let's open up to John chapter 17. All right, bro. So we're going to be talking about the work of Jesus today. Okay. So John 17, verse 24. Verse 20. So here's, here's what's going on here. Jesus has been running his ministry for three years, mm. right? And it's coming close time to when he's about to be crucified. He knows it. He's talking to his disciples, and he, he lays out some, some wisdom. He says, here, the counselor is coming. He's getting them prepared for the, the time without him. Mm. And then he prays to God. Mm. And he says, I don't only ask for these, the ones who he's preaching to now, but also for those who believe in me through their word. Yeah. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent us. Mm -hmm. That you have sent me. He says, my prayer is that us, that the people who will believe my message will be one. Mm -hmm. how, how close is he, is he saying? As I am in you, as Jesus is close to God, mm -hmm. we are unified with each other. Amen. Unified with the body of believers. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that's what Jesus' prayer was for the, for the followers that would come. And so my question for us is, is that true today? Mm -hmm. Is it true that, that I am as unified with my brothers and sisters in Christ wow. as Jesus is unified to God. Come on, bro. Wow. Is there something between one of my brothers mm. that I need to get resolved? Is there yeah. something that's going on to where we're not together? And this is, this is, Jesus is about to die. His dying wish right here is that God bring them unity mm. together. Mm -hmm. And why? He says, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Wow. You know why he says that? Because there's power in unity. Right. And there's power in togetherness. There's power in people who are different coming together as one. Yeah. And so if we can't be unified together, if we can't be together, if we just say, well, we're just going to have to split. We're just going to have to be different. Mm. We're just going to have to not communicate with one another because we don't agree. Then how is anyone going to believe our message? Right, right. How is our message going to have any power? Yeah. And so today, we need to remember, we need to focus on who is it, how can I be unified together with the Bible? In Matthew uh, chapter 5, it says if you're, if you're bringing a gift to God, and you remember that your brother has something against you, not that you have something against somebody else, but somebody has something against you, he says... Leave your gift at the altar and first go be reconciled to your brother. Mm. So guys, today, let's keep in mind that unity among the believers right. is most important. Yes. And let's put aside our differences and come together. Come on, bro. Amen. Let's pray. Good afternoon, church. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. In the name of Jesus, praise God, right? I'm yeah. Augustus. Uh, it is my privilege to do the offering portion of the service, and I want to thank God first uh, and foremost. Um, thank you, Garrison. That's actually pretty powerful, because uh, it actually leads into um, the same book, the book of John. Yeah. Okay, and in the offering portion of it, I just want you to remember two words, significance, right, uh, and sufficiency. And so this is the part where where sometimes in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the sixth chapter of John, there's a boy that's offering uh, uh, two fishes and loaves of bread. Now, anybody looking at this picture would know he's poor, that if it was for his lunch, uh, this is all he had to eat. And he may have had a big family. He may have been doing this toiling all day to make sure he has enough to feed the family. But he comes across Jesus. And at this point, Jesus, as Gary said, he's on his ministry. He's up at, he's at the peak of his ministry. And 
the sufficiency and the, and the significance of this, of this, of this, what this boy has is some people would look at it and says, well, wait a minute, he come from a poor place, fish is all he can afford, bread is all he can afford, and what have you. But at the end of the day, that fish and that bread, Jesus took it. And remember that that two fish and five loaves of bread fed 5,000 people. 5,000 men, actually. You guys get that? Yeah. But it also fed women and children. So that had to be in the, in the, in the numbers of 10 to 15,000 people based upon what some people would think is this boy is insignificant. He's just a child. He only had two loaves. He only had two fish. And he only had five loaves of bread. Does that make sense? Yeah. But with Jesus, when you give it to Jesus, right, Jesus is about turning that around. And whatever little that we have, he would actually feed so many people. He would, the ministry would go out. And so I just wanted to get understanding of the fact that it don't feel at, at any point that you're insignificant mm -hmm. and that you don't have enough to give or you're not qualified to give. Give from your heart, whatever it may be, if it's service, if it's money, if it's effort, whatever it may be. Where is it offering to God, whatever you may, he's going to, he's going to actually multiply the sufficiency because he deems it significant. Amen? Yeah. So that leads me to what we did at the 8. Okay, I had a, in God, we had a, a function a couple of weeks ago called at the 8. And basically, it was just, it was phenomenal. About 50 people showed up, and I'm going to tell you, there was, a, there was a revolution that went on. And I don't want to talk much about it, but I want to, I have um, Mia, who happens to be a new uh, Christian in Come Christ on, Jesus. Mia. <laughs>
They saw that they needed to recommit themselves to God. We laughed, we cried, we sing, we enjoyed life. And it brought me to a new recognition of life itself for me and my newfound commitment to God. Mm. I think uh, Augustus did a great job. Come on. Thank you for everybody who was there. So let's just pray it out.